Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I'm excited to welcome globally recognized specialist in Lyme disease and New York Times bestseller, Dr. Richard Horowitz. Dr. Horowitz has treated over 12,000 patients through a combination of complementary integrative protocols with more classical approaches. Good morning, Dr. Horowitz. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'm so excited about this interview because I know that there's a tremendous amount of a wealth of information that you will share. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this interview. No, it's my pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you. I know that you're uh, fresh off seven hours of, of delivering uh, incredible content to our medical community here at A4M. So I would just like the shorter version of that seven-hour talk, perhaps. Uh, so what initially prompted you to go into medicine? It was clearly my Jewish mother. <laughs> there was absolutely no doubt about that. I wanted to go into music and my theater. Son, doctor. And my And my mother said, I think it's better you become a doctor. And uh, fortunately, I like biology. I had been doing pre-med in school. Um, and you know, it just so happened, my stepfather happened to have been a surgeon. So I was in the hospitals all the time when I was young, uh, rounding with him in the hospitals, going into the OR, actually watching him do surgeries when I was 12 years old. So I've been in hospitals and exposed to medicine since a very young age. That's fascinating. So uh, were you a musician, though, as a child? I, I was. I was at the Brooklyn uh, Academy of Music and playing guitar and voice and the leads in all the high school and uh, even in college I was doing at Northwestern the Dolphin shows. I was, had parts in there so I always had an interest. It was always a fun uh, kind of sidebar thing you could do to amuse yourself and meet new people. It was fun. That's wonderful. So you went on to become board certified in internal medicine. So I know that you are a renowned Lyme disease specialist. What got you into studying Lyme disease? So I had finished my medical training at the Free University of Brussels in Brussels, Belgium for seven years. It was a training program um, in French. And when I came back to the United States, I did my training at Mount Sinai um, in the city in internal medicine. And I was offered a job by Vassar Hospital to come up uh, to the Poughkeepsie area. Um, I was the assistant director of medicine there for several years. And I didn't realize when I was moving upstate I was moving into the largest Lyme endemic area in the United States, which was Dutchess County, New York. So patients started coming in. They had tick bites. They had bullseye rashes. Um, 75, maybe 80% got better with standard treatment, but 20 or 25% did not get better. And one of the things I was taught in medical school, and my teacher had specifically um, highlighted this aspect of medicine, is I had asked him what was the most important thing I needed to know when I got out, and he said, compassion. He said, exchange yourself with others, do for others what you would want done, and everything will go well. So these patients were coming back sick, and I said, gee, I've got to work on their behalf. They are suffering. I have to find out why they're suffering. How can I make them better? Um, and this led to a journey of now three decades of searching for answers for these patients who are chronically ill with tick-borne diseases. Um, and it's been actually a fascinating journey. So if a patient didn't know that they were bitten by a tick, from what I understand, there are so many symptoms that mimic other diseases that are out there, chronic conditions. So how did you actually pinpoint, or how can you pinpoint that it's Lyme disease? So there's a classic constellation of symptoms that you see with Lyme disease. Um, first of all, it's a multi-systemic disorder, meaning it's usually not one symptom. You can get just joint pain in one joint, but usually it's multi-systemic, meaning you have many symptoms. So the constellation of symptoms is usually that you're chronically tired, you have musculoskeletal pain, uh, nerve pain, tingling, numbness, burning. And the hallmark of the pain is that it migrates. It moves from one place to another. So if you have joint pain in one joint, and three days later it's moved to another joint, and four days later it's in your shoulder and then your knee, migratory joint pain, migratory muscle pain, and migratory nerve pain, tingling, numbness, burning, stabbing sensations, absolutely classic for Lyme. So if you have a chronic fatiguing musculoskeletal illness with a stiff neck and headache, a lot of times they have light and sound sensitivity, a lot of cognitive problems, memory concentration problems. But it sounds like MS to me, or it sounds like, you know, it could be a combination of things. Well, there is an overlap, actually, right. with MS, which I'll talk about in a second. But, but this classic constellation of headaches, memory problems, nerve pain, muscle and joint pain, fatigue, 
Um, problem sleeping, very classic. I can't fall asleep. I keep waking up in the middle of the night with mood swings. That's the classic constellation. Now, we published a paper in the International Journal of General Medicine about four months ago. And this was a three-year study with 1,600 people. And we validated my questionnaire called the horowitz msitz Questionnaire, or HMQ. And we now have statistical validation of a screening questionnaire. If you score over 63 on the questionnaire, um, that is two standard deviations above the mean, you have a very high probability of having Lyme. In the 40s and 50s, if you score on that questionnaire, it means a moderate probability. Um, and below 25, it's not very likely. So we took a history from these patients. We validated this with researchers, uh, Dr. Phyllis Freeman and Dr. Mary Alice Cetera from the State University of New Paltz. And now we have a validated screening questionnaire because the tests are not reliable. So you have to understand what that constellation of symptoms are. And you'll also see women will tell you around their menstrual cycle, they feel much worse right before, during, or after when the hormones go down. Um, if you happen to take antibiotics for an unrelated problem like a urinary tract infection or an upper respiratory infection, people will get better, like with their chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, or get worse because you're killing off the spirochetes. It's called a Herxheimer reaction. So if you look at this constellation and you look at uh, bands on the Western blot, there's a game I play with patients called Lime Bingo. And Lime Bingo means if you have any one of the following numbers on a Western blot, bingo, you have been exposed to Lyme disease. And those numbers are 23, which is the outer surface protein C of the organism, 31, which is the outer surface protein A, 34, the outer surface protein B, 39, and 8393. So any one of those bands means you've been exposed to Borreliosis. Now, there's over 100 different strains and 300 strains worldwide um, of Borrelia. So the problem is, is that there's all of these different types of Borrelia that are out there, and the standard allies in Western blood does not pick up all of them. So it's, it's tricky. That's why the questionnaire and understanding the symptoms are so important. So how do you treat Lyme disease then if the onset can come from various different types of bacteria, I guess? So it's complicated simply in the sense that most people, when they get Lyme disease, they don't usually just get an infection with Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, the organism that causes Lyme. They usually also have associated co-infections. So a large majority of my patients have parasites. There's a malaria parasite called Babesia. It shows up in at least 80 to 90% of my patients. And that's like having malaria on top of Lyme disease. So those people will have uh, day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, uh, air hunger where they can't catch their breath, an unexplained cough. Those are very classic symptoms of Babesia. Many have Bartonella, which is a form of cat scratch disease. Many have been exposed to mycoplasma, some to tularemia and brucella, several to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, typhus and Q fever, anaplasma, ehrlichia, relapsing fever. So the problem is, is that all of these different co-infections are now being found in the ticks, and with one tick bite, you have a very high chance of being multiply co-infected. Oh so when we treat, you have to treat the different forms of the bacteria, which are called cell wall forms, cystic forms. They go inside the cells, and they're now being found in biofilms. And this is important because biofilms are like when you go to the dentist, you've got to get the plaque taken off. They've now found that these bacteria are hiding under biofilms, and they are what are called persisters, meaning they can be uh, metabolically inactive, sleeping, dormant, you can't kill them if they're in this state unless you use very specific drugs. And we've published in the medical literature in the last few years some novel treatments using persister drugs used for tuberculosis or leprosy. And they're working, um, they're really wonderful. And in fact, we'll be publishing more studies this year. But we have patients who have failed every regimen who are doing wonderfully well on these new persister protocols that I describe in my, in my book, How Can I Get Better? So as a specialist in this field, and one of the most renowned specialists in this field, clearly you have an extraordinary ability and capacity to treat the patient as a whole. And um, with experience and skill, not only in hormonal imbalance and stress management and detox, but also chronic infections and genomics. So how would you manage all of these complicated factors associated with Lyme disease? And what are some of the integrative modalities that you implement into treating a patient with Lyme disease? So when I was searching for answers for Lyme, every few years um, a piece of the puzzle would come to me. So for example, about 20 years ago, a patient comes in in a wheelchair paralyzed from the waist down. I give her the questionnaire. She's got drenching sweats and she's in her 30s. And I said, well, 
It sounds like you might have Babesia, but it was not supposed to be in the Hudson Valley. We sent out the ticks from our area. It did show a small amount of Babesia. She tested positive, and within 10 days of treating for this malarial parasite, she walked out of the wheelchair for the first point in time. My goodness. Several years later, a woman comes in and she can't talk. She has aphasia, no speech is able to come out, no words. We found after which she had Bartonella. I'd given her a drug called Avalox or Moxifloxacin. She spoke for the first time in years. Then we had patients come in with heavy metals. We found that they had a lot of mercury and lead and arsenic. And the problem is, is that Lyme patients have neuropathy. They have nerve pain. Well, it turns out that not only does Borrelia cause nerve pain and neuropathy, so does lead, arsenic, and mercury. So about 25% when we pulled out their heavy metals and chelated them, they got better with all of their Lyme symptoms. Then we discovered mold toxins were starting to show up in about two thirds of our patients with aflatoxins, trichothicines, um, gliotoxins, which are immunosuppressive. We started treating people for the mold toxins and lo and behold, a certain percentage started getting better. Uh, patients who were sick for 13 years would say, I'm chronically ill with all these symptoms. We would check their adrenals and hormones. They had no adrenal function. Within one week of putting them on adrenal supplements, all of a sudden, their symptoms were tremendously better. So what happened year after year is that we would discover pieces of the puzzle and detoxification from an integrative standpoint is absolutely crucial. When Lyme patients say they have neurocognitive deficits with memory concentration problems, it's not just about treating the infections. You've got to detoxify these patients because there are neurotoxins that are produced by the bacteria called quinolinic acid, and then you've got all these environmental toxins getting in. I had a patient who was in a dark room for two years watching Netflix reruns, a computer specialist. One dose of glutathione IV, his brain completely woke up and he was able to go back to work with detoxification. So I created a model called MSIDS, Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome. And this is like going to a doctor with 16 nails in your foot and saying you have foot pain. If you don't find all the nails and pull them out, the people are not gonna get better. So the key, and this is what I taught yesterday at A4M, is you've gotta go through this in detail. You make the list of the 16 MSIDS points, and you start going through it piece by piece. Bacteria, viruses, fungus. Um, so you go through this piece by piece, and what you discover is some patients, there's one nail that you have to pull that makes them better. Um, for some patients, it's four. For some patients, it's seven. Um, Food sensitivities play a huge role in driving inflammation in patients who have leaky gut or who are histamine sensitive, who might have what's called mast cell disorder. So we've discovered all of these different factors which were not done in the NIH double-blind studies on Lyme. All they did is look at Lyme disease. And what I've explained to people is you can't just look at the NIH studies because they didn't look at these 16 factors that I've been finding um, are responsible for making people ill. So how is a traditional practitioner or even other integrative practitioners who are practicing internal medicine and seeing chronically ill patients, how are they implementing your approach into their practice and how can one implement your approach into their practice? So the, the trick of implementing my approach is that you have to learn the MSIDS model. Now for doctors who've never been trained in integrative medicine, you have to have some background in it. So in both of my books, Why Can't I Get Better and How Can I Get Better, I do actually explain the integrative approach. Um, I think it's very useful to go to these type of conferences um, because you'll learn a lot of integrative medicine and understand the biochemistry, how it all works. Um, so I attended, of course, these conferences for years, but it is in the book. So for doctors who just want to have a basic general understanding, my books do contain information on heavy metals, what they do, how to detox them. It talks about the hormones and using things like DHEA cortisol by saliva that most of us may not have learned about in medical school. Or why is the microbiome of the gut extremely important? There's so much research coming out um, on the microbiome for strokes, heart attacks, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, Parkinson's disease, right? Which they also didn't learn in medical school. Which we also <laughs> didn't learn. Well, and that's new research, of course, that's right. come out in the last few years. But um, you can get that from my books, although it's really important that people go to these type of conferences and learn. But it is there, and the last book I actually put in all of the details of how to treat patients, meaning the dosages. Because doctors have said, well, what's the dosages of the antibiotics? Well, what is the dosage of DMSA to pull out the heavy metals? How do you detoxify mold toxins? I actually have all of those details in the books because 
I'm one person. I can't see the whole world. We're in the middle of a worldwide epidemic. Um, every state in the U.S. has now been affected. It's across Europe in epidemic proportions. When I was in China years ago, they told me that 6% of the Chinese population had it. So we're dealing with a worldwide epidemic. So if anyone has been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, dementia, early dementia, you can't explain, um, neuropsychiatric disorders, sudden OCD and psychosis, Lyme is the great imitator. We have to be very careful because it's imitating all of these different diseases. And why is there currently no vaccine for Lyme disease then? Or is there something coming down the pike? So there was a vaccine for Lyme disease called the Lymerix vaccine. The problem is, is that there were some autoimmune complications from the vaccine. Um, people, some people got very sick with uh, encephalopathy, with uh, brain uh, problems, with arthritis. So it was taken off the market by Smith Klein Beecham. There are new vaccines that are now being worked on. Uh, there's one in Europe, they're finishing um, I think it's phase three clinical trials they're on right now. Um, I'm now working at levels in Washington for the uh, HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. There is a subcommittee, we have six subcommittees. One of the subcommittees is looking at vaccines. So we do need to look at vaccines, but we need safe and effective vaccines. Personally, my vaccine that I would like to see done is called the tick spit vaccine. If these ticks are containing multiple organisms, Lyme disease, relapsing fever, ehrlichia, anaplasma, babesia, um, Powassan virus, which can get in within 15 minutes of a tick bite and can be fatal in 10 to 15% of the cases. You need a vaccine that's gonna cover and stop all of these different co-infections with Lyme. There was a researcher by the name of Stephen Wykell who started working on this at University of Connecticut. He's now on one of these subcommittees. And he was developing a tick spit vaccine that when the tick attached, you would have antibodies against the saliva of the tick and the tick would fall off. Wow. Now that for me is a perfect solution because I see all of these patients who are sick, not just from Lyme disease, but from all these associated co-infections. So that for me would really be the ideal vaccine that we'd want to look at. Is Washington working towards that? So, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic at this point. Um, the first meeting of the HHS uh, Tick-Borne Disease Working Group took place in December. Uh, we're having our next meeting, actually, a webinar this Monday, uh, where we'll be meeting and the subcommittees will be uh, discussing our respective subcommittee assignments and what we'll be doing. So, you know, it's exciting because- You may be out of a job in a few years. <laughs> um, I hope so. I hope so, truthfully, because I've devoted my life to finding answers for this. And um, I'm cautiously optimistic. There's some very good people who are on the committee, um, very bright people who've been doing this for a long time. Now, clearly, the, when the 21st Century Cures Act was signed by President Obama into law, it created this committee. And we had to have diverse viewpoints. So there are clearly people on both sides um, who are on these committees. We hope that they will be objective, um, that they will have compassion for these sick and suffering patients because the first meeting was mainly the patients and the stakeholders who are discussing how much they have suffered. And I posted on my Facebook site um, detailed analysis and you know, commentary about what happened on those first two meetings. The patients basically said, look, we've been sick for years. The tests are unreliable. Um, we've lost our lives. We've lost our savings. Um, there's a political aspect where the medical boards in the United States have gone after doctors for treating this disease. So you have a very serious problem because you have a political disease not just a medical one, where doctors were afraid to treat patients in the middle of an epidemic when these patients can be even dying from these tick-borne diseases. So we have to fix this. And the patients testified on this. There was a lawyer, Susan Green, who testified about how she had to protect doctors at the state level uh, because they were just adopting very restrictive infectious disease guidelines, which unfortunately only work for early Lyme. They do not work for late Lyme. Uh, the infectious disease doctors don't know why these patients are chronically ill. They say it's tissue damage, autoimmunity, um, you know, could be persistence, but we don't really know why. Now, I've been doing this for over three decades. Um, the blood tests are not reliable, primarily because there are so many different species and strains of Lyme disease. And every two years, we discover a new species. So Borrelia lanei in California just got discovered several months ago. It was named after Bob Lane. That's a pathogenic species that we didn't know about before. Several years before that, there was Borrelia bassetti um, here in the Carolinas. 
Um, there's Borrelia calorhinsis. Cal so there's all these different species that you can't pick up on standard testing, and they definitely persist. We've seen DNA evidence, RNA evidence of persistence. So I've seen it, the medical literature says it, but unfortunately with the politics, it has not really kind of gotten into the mainstream medical and not at the level of all of the medical boards. So unfortunately, some of the governors have had to pass um, laws at this point to protect physicians. That's the case in New York. Uh, it's the case in other states, um, Rhode Island, Maine. But that really shouldn't be the case in the United States of America. If we have an epidemic in our hands that is hurting the American people, we need to be coming together and working together for these sick and suffering patients. So I'm optimistic that this federal tick-borne disease working group will do that. Um, again, we have wonderful people on the committee. And Kristen Honey, who's on the federal side, she said when we started the committee, we're going to hit the reset button, that whatever's happened in the past is the past. We're going to start fresh, innocent, and we're now, I think, about to start the journey of really working on behalf of all of these sick patients. We can hope. We can hope that you'll be able to pick up the guitar and uh, go on tour. So uh, Little Birdie told me that um, you have a music video out about ticks. So can you elaborate on that and, and yes, share the so, story? Um, so Daryl Hall and I have known each other for a while. And I was with Daryl one time. And I said, hey, Daryl, I, I want you to hear something. So I pulled out my guitar and I started singing this song called Ballad of the Deer Tick, right, it's on YouTube. And he laughed so hard, he said, come on into the studio and let's record it. So I recorded it with him. I thought he meant just, I'll record it. I didn't realize he was actually gonna come on and sing and play guitar and put down Hammond organ tracks and his lead guitarist, T-Bone Walk, when he was still alive. T-Bone also played mandolin and backup guitar. It was a wonderful experience and so it's, it's fun. I've always had a passion for music and for theater and um, it's kind of fun to be able to do this on the side a little bit. So what else do you do in your spare time when you're not trying to prevent, or should I say save the world from, from Lyme disease? So um, that really is the majority of my practice. So this year for the first time I've gone down to uh, you know, part-time clinical practice two days a week because I'm serving in Washington. And we're now data mining um, the charts in our office. Uh, we've been working on many, many clinical studies. I literally have probably 13 or 14 clinical studies I need to publish. So this year, I'm starting to look at publishing more. Uh, we have a paper we're about to release on stem cell therapy for a patient with chronic variable immune deficiency who used to get 15 infections a year, um, then got Lyme disease, was very ill, um, and now his immune system is working perfectly um, with embryonic stem cells. So that paper we're about to present uh, to the medical literature. Um, we have another Dapsone study, one of these persister drugs we've discussed in 200 people. We got a grant from Bay Area Lyme, we're gonna publish that. Uh, there's another study on pyrazinamide, another persister drug we're gonna be doing. Uh, we have pregnant women who have had Babesia in the third trimester of their pregnancy, which could kill the fetus. So we have several cases where we've used anti-parasitic protocols in the last trimester for pregnant women where the babies were healthy at birth. I've got to publish that. And we're working on an app, um, a digital app um, called the Lyme Navigator app to help doctors and patients to kind of navigate through the maze of what are these symptoms? How do I do a differential diagnosis? Um, what are the treatment options? How do I choose? I realized from having written these books and lectured at places like A4M, the doctors need to come and train with me. And I've trained over 100 physicians. But I think if I would have put it out in a digital format, where then we could accumulate the data from multiple medical centers, upload it into the cloud, like the Amazon cloud we found out for this app can hold one million people at once, we could then have a computer analyze all of the data and really come up with answers quickly um, for this. So there's a lot of projects, a lot of balls in the air. Um, I have a lot of energy to do this, and I'm happy to. I, I don't know how much free time I'll have to accomplish all these projects, but these are kind of exciting projects that I'm looking forward to working on, and I'm looking for a physician. So we're looking for a new doctor to join us. Uh, there's one I'm interviewing now who went through Andrew Weil's Integrative Medicine Program, who's a board-certified uh, internist endocrinologist. Uh, so she's being interviewed. There was a nurse practitioner here yesterday uh, who shared an interest. So if anyone's listening to the video and you'd like to save the world with me, please call our office. Um, we're happy to interview you because I really need help. There's so many patients who want to come into our practice and 
we just don't have room, right? So over the years, you've seen over 12,000 patients? That's correct. I've seen over 13,000 over at 13, this point. Over 13,000. Okay. And how are most of them doing now? You know, fortunately, most of them doing, are doing very, very well. Um, the 16-point MSIDS map that, you know, I've developed, um, it's not that these 16 points were completely unknown to medicine. Uh, for example, Pam Smith was teaching on mitochondrial function yesterday. Well, mitochondrial dysfunction is part of the MSIDS map. So, but the problem for physicians is these patients are so complex, right? They're, they've really, they've got so many symptoms, 20, 30 symptoms, that if you don't know how to take a history and how to kind of do a very logical, you know, put them into subsets of how to look at the symptoms, do a differential diagnosis, it's complicated. So they're doing very well because the majority of my patients, when we've treated them with these new persister drugs, we found that doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone is the most effective combination in culture for killing Borrelia in these biofilm forms. And we have a new study, which is a higher dose dapsone study. One gentleman recently came into my practice and he took this higher dose of dapsone. He had been ill for years, very ill, neuropathy, nerve pain, could hardly get out of bed. He's, he only did antibiotics for three or four months. He's now off for six months. I saw him yes, this past week. He's 85% normal, and the only reason he's not 100%, he has neuropathy needing IVIG, IV immunoglobulins. My wife just went through this protocol. She's had Lyme disease for over three decades. So she's a very nice guinea pig for me because she's a good sport, and any That worked out well for you. Yes, it did. <laughs> um, well, it did and it didn't, of course, because my beloved has a serious disease, but you know, we found with her, she's like the, the MSIDS woman because she's got, you know, thyroids and adrenals and mold toxicity um, and heavy metals. And she had Lyme and Babesia and Bartonella and mycoplasma and couldn't sleep. And so she had all of these overlapping factors. So every time I do a new protocol, we try it. And she went through this new protocol and it is the best she has done in the 21 years of our marriage. Her brain is so awake and clear. So it's exciting because Every few years, I keep discovering these new things to help people. Um, and it's, it, it keeps it fresh and interesting and exciting for me because I've been working on a cure for three decades. So the vast majority do well because for the patients who've never been treated with these persister drugs, it helps at least two thirds of the people that have failed other protocols. And some of these patients have never had their hormones checked. They've never been checked for heavy metals or mold. They still can't get to sleep, which drives an inflammatory response. They don't know they're gluten sensitive or have food allergies with histamine release, and they've never gotten off their allergic foods. Um, their detoxification pathways are clogged up, and no one's ever given them glutathione or detox. So if you go through the 16-point MSIDs, it helps the vast majority of these patients. And I believe it's going to be really the paradigm shift that we need for all chronic diseases. Because what I showed yesterday during the slides, Infections and toxins, environmental toxins, are related to how people are sick with Lyme. The same thing with autism spectrum disorder. It's in the literature that some of these autistic children have Lyme and infections, they're treated, they get better. They're now showing the environmental toxins are getting into these kids through University of California studies, Harvard studies, Dr. Landrigan, that if you pull out these toxins, give them broccoli seed extracts, treat the infections, they get better. The Alzheimer's patients, they are finding spirochetes like Lyme disease, um, relapsing fever, chlamydia pneumonia, helicobacter pylori, herpes viruses in biofilms in these patients. Judith McCloskey from Switzerland. And they're finding pesticides from JAMA, this was published in JAMA, wow. are getting into the brains of Alzheimer's patients, causing amyloid production and tau proteins. So infections and toxins are causing people to be sick from Lyme. Same thing with multiple sclerosis, which has been linked up to chlamydia and ammonia, Lyme, Epstein-Barr virus variants. So if you look at MS, Lyme, autism, Alzheimer's, ALS, Lyme can ALS. cause an ALS mimic. Wow. They found environmental toxins are causing ALS, apart from genetic problems with superoxide dismutase. We need a shift in medicine, right? 70%, right? of the patients in the United States that are driving the healthcare costs up have chronic diseases. So why are we not looking at chronic diseases, but what we learned in medical school was Pasteur's postulate. One cause for one disease. That is not what works in 21st century medicine. We need a full paradigm shift 
to the MSIDS model, which is a good start, let other people develop it and expand it, that it's multifactorial causes that are causing chronic diseases, which will account, I believe, from what I've seen in my practice and looking at the medical literature, that will explain a lot of these chronic diseases because the common denominator is inflammation. They've shown that inflammation is responsible for heart attacks, for strokes, for Alzheimer's, uh, for Parkinson's disease, for dermatitis, for eczema, for asthma. It's an inflammatory response, but you've got to find where all the inflammatory sources are coming from. And that is not being done classically in medicine. So I hope that this model will start people thinking about rising healthcare costs, suffering of patients, how do we improve the health of Americans and patients worldwide. I think the MSIDS model is a good place to start. And again, I'm hoping with this Washington group, my goal is not, in fact, just Lyme. I would like to help America with all of these chronic diseases because I've gone through the literature in great detail. I think there are answers there, and we just haven't looked at the model, but we need a paradigm shift. I think that's obvious from anyone who's been doing integrative medicine for a long time. Is there anything that anyone can do to prevent getting Lyme disease? Yes, you could never walk out of your house or go outside or step on a blade of grass. So that would be a no? Um, that would be a no. A no, there is actually something you can do. Um, so there is a spray called permethrin spray. And in fact, the Army, they now embed permethrin in all of the uniforms because people in the military are getting Lyme and getting sick. Um, so you can get permethrin from the hardware stores. You take your clothes outside, you spray it with permethrin, and that will kill the ticks. You can even have some of your clothes sent to places where they will embed it with permethrin, okay? So that's a good you know, trick to use. And also there are sprays that you can put on your skin. Um, Avon Skin So Soft makes a spray called um, IR3535. It's been shown to be safe even in pregnant women in Europe. It repels ticks and mosquitoes, right? There's another one, Picaridin, repels ticks and mosquitoes, right? So these are generally safer than DEET. You may need a 20 or 25% DEET, which lasts for about six hours if you're really in deep woods um, where there's a very high risk. There were some problems with DEET in young children with seizures. There's not a lot of cases, but I don't use a lot of DEET. I men, mainly tell people, use eucalyptus oil, IR3535, pick a ridin on your skin, use permethrin sprays on your clothes, and then do tick checks when you come inside. Um, and you've got to take off your clothes. You can even put them in the dryer at high heat. If you have ticks on them, it will destroy the ticks within 15 minutes. And in our property, where we live in the Hudson Valley, um, we have bait boxes around our property um, so that when the mice go in and they feed off the oats, there's a little roller with permethrin that kills the ticks on the mice and they spray with something called Ultra Tempo that destroys, they do it twice a year for the nymphs, which come out in the spring, and the adults. So we never find ticks on our property anymore and Ultra Tempo does not get into the groundwater, right? I'm very careful with environmental chemicals because we have three to 500 chemicals getting into our bodies every day, but um, my neighbors, almost every neighbor on my block has had Lyme disease. So, you know, we need something to protect in the environment. We need personal protection. But ultimately, we're going to have to figure out how to control the tick population. And there are companies looking at this. U.S. Biologics is looking at it with um, pellets that have something that will give the mice antibodies so that when the ticks feed on the mice, um, which are one of the main reservoirs, that the antibodies kill the ticks. I think CRISPR technology, which is the genetics, that's something that's going to be interesting. Maybe we can sterilize the ticks just like they're looking at it for mosquitoes for malaria, right? They're looking at it on Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod area for the mice, but I would actually like to see the CRISPR technology with gene sequencing and uh, splicing. Yeah, I'd like to see that done to try and sterilize the ticks. I think that might be a good solution. So, you know, hopefully now we've got kind of a, uh, a think tank of some of the best scientists in the world who are on these committees, hopefully we'll come up with some answers. Fascinating. I really think this is an exciting time for you and for the American public. And I thank you so much for all of your work and your research and your energy and your passion and commitment to this. And it's very exciting, so thank you. you no, know, thank you for the interview. It's, it's always a pleasure to share information and help people.